Most of the greatest fantasy universes have a creation myth, a grand tale of cosmic beings weaving the fabric of the world into existence, such as Eru Iluvatar of the Lord of the Rings mythos, who brings Arda into existence through his great song. Elden Ring is no different. We learn via Hayeta that it is the greater will who is responsible for the diverse life that we witness on this mortal plane by fracturing something known as the One Great. While this may seem like a brief segment of the lore, it spawns multiple questions about the formation of life as we know it, as well as a bigger question. What actually is the greater will? Many in the community, including myself, have been hasty in categorising the greater will as one of the outer gods, and of course there is logic to this, given they share a certain nebulous characterization. However, is this actually true, or is the greater will something more? The greater will is the dominant force in this setting, controlling life, creating it, and imposing its order upon it. So we have to ask ourselves, does this fit the template of an outer god, or does the greater will more closely match the template of an Abrahamic creator god? These are the grand questions that this video hopes to address, for pondering these foundational ideas has added even more depth to this incredible world of Elden Ring for me, and I hope by the end of this video you feel the same, even if you do not agree with all the points I make. So join me this week as we assess the nature of the greater will and the outer gods. But before we start guys, if you like Elden Ring lore then consider subscribing to the channel and liking this video, as I have hours of lore content for you to sink your teeth into. But he desired rather to subdue to his will both elves and men, envying the gifts with which Iluvatar promised to endow them, and he wished himself to have subjects and servants, and to be called lord, and to be master over other wills. Such were the desires of Melkor, the first Dark Lord of the Lord of the Rings saga, a cosmic being who envied the ability of his progenitor, Iluvatar, to create life. For Melkor wished to create for himself, rather than being a mere instrument of something greater than he, and if he could not create, he would dominate, warp and control Arda and those who inhabited it. Melkor and Iluvatar both are unfathomable cosmic beings beyond human ken, but only one of them had the ability to create. Only one of them was the supreme deity, a being based on Tolkien's own Catholic beliefs in a supreme soul deity. That idea and difference is the core of this video. The differences between a being who can create and one who can merely act upon the world which has already been created. It is my aim to do a comprehensive analysis of both the greater will and the outer gods, their abilities, their aims and their nature ultimately to highlight their differences. I myself have been quick to name the greater will an outer god, such as in my Mikla lore video, but the more I have studied the lore and attempted to understand the nature of Elden Ring's world and its history, the more I have come to disagree with this idea. I think that the greater will is something more than an outer god, and that it takes the possession of the supreme deity of this world. My main reasons for doing so and therefore the outline of my thesis are number 1. In-game references to outer gods and the greater will not crossing paths 2. The language used for both of these different gods 3. What outer gods actually are and what they can do and 4. The greater will as a supreme creator deity that doesn't fit the mould of an outer god. So with this thesis laid out, let us tackle the first of these, and that is the mentions of Outer Gods and the Greater Will in-game, and their lack of interaction. There are 8 direct mentions to Outer Gods in the game, with 4 of these being semi-repetitive, as they are tied to Mikola's Needles. But in totality, these 8 references reference the Scarlet Rot God via the Scorpion Stinger, and via the Lake of Rot map. Then there is the Formless Mother, or Mother of Blood, which is mentioned by Mogwin's Sacred Spear. Then there's the Outer God of the Deathrite Birds and the Twin Bird, which is mentioned on the Twin Bird Kite Shield. And then finally there is the Outer God of the Frenzied Flame, which is implied to be one via the Mikola's Needle and the other versions of this needle. 
because it is used to ward away the influence of the outer gods and this item's only use is to ward away the influence of the frenzied flame. There's also another mention of the ancient god of rot in the blue dancer talisman so let's be generous and bring that up to 9 direct mentions to the outer gods in game. There are 15 unique references to the greater well in game including item descriptions, dialogue and I say unique because there are repeat references in all of the Nox armor and the two mirror helms. None of the mentions of the Outer Gods name the Greater Will as one of their number, nor do any of the mentions of the Greater Will label it as an Outer God, and this should really be our first clue that the Greater Will stands apart from these nebulous deities, or at least make it clear that it is not a certainty that it is an Outer God. And thankfully for my theory, this is also backed up by the original Japanese used, a nuance that was brought to my attention by the viewer the Great Cosmic Axiotl, who commented on one of my community posts. The Great Cosmic Axiotl claims the information they are providing comes via the famous Italian YouTuber Sabaku no Meiko in episode 38 of his Elden Ring series, which I will link below. Axiotl noted that the term in Japanese for Outer God, Sotonaro, is fitting because it is used to define beings that fall outside a group or a system outside God. Oxyatl then notes that the Greater Will is never referred to in the same way, and in fact the term in Japanese for Greater Will is a word that is closely related to the Biblical God in the Japanese translations. This idea of the Greater Will being linguistically tied to the Biblical God is backed up by YouTuber Doug Mangai, a horrendously underrated channel that provides some of the most in-depth breakdowns of the Japanese that I have ever seen, and I highly recommend you take a look at their channel. In a video on Hayata's dialogue regarding the Greater Will, Dugman Guy backs up the idea that the Greater Will is linguistically tied to the Abrahamic or Biblical God by noting that the Japanese for Greater Will in the game borrows from the Japanese translation of the Old Testament, and they believe that by using the same language, the writers of Elden Ring are very much trying to evoke the idea that the Greater Will is the God of the Lands Between. So again, a massive shout out to Dugman Guy for this awesome work. But to make sure I covered all my bases, I turned to someone I often do for Japanese translations, Last Protagonist, who was able to provide the following information when I asked him to verify these translations. And Last Protagonist did indeed confirm that the Greater Will is not referred to in the same manner as the Outer Gods linguistically. So thanks again to Last Protagonist for this verification, to the Great Cosmic Axiotl for bringing this to my attention, and finally to Dugman Guy for his excellent work. This linguistic proof should be evidence enough that the Greater Will is meant to be standing apart from what we know as the Outer Gods, that the authors want us to believe it is something different. However, this was apparent to me even before I realised there was differences in the Japanese mainly because of the differences in presentation and in the lore. I believe the Outer Gods behave and operate in a different manner to the Greater Will. So next I think it would be prudent for us to discuss the Outer Gods so that we can properly comprehend their nature and see how it differs from the Greater Will. Something else I have recently come to comprehend is the importance of grooming and taking care of yourself. And that's where today's sponsor, Manscaped, comes in. The Lawnmower 4.0 is the perfect tool for any tarnished who wants to make sure they are looking and feeling their best before they kneel before the greater will. Manscaped was kind enough to send me their performance package 4.0, which is packed full of everything needed to keep you nice and fresh. Personally, below the belt grooming always scares me after a few close shaves in my life. But after using the full range of the performance package 4.0, I've never felt better. With its special skin safe technology and waterproof design, you can use this bad boy anywhere and feel smoother than a godskin noble's robe. Follow up your shave with a crop preserver and crop reviver and I promise you will feel fresher than you ever have. For a limited time only, when you purchase the performance package 4.0, you get two free gifts, the travel bag and the Manscaped anti-chafing boxers. Head over to manscaped.com and get 20% off plus free shipping and those two free gifts when you use my promo code SMALL at manscaped.com. So big thanks to Manscaped for sponsoring this video, and now back to the lore. 
The Outer Gods, in essence, are great cosmic beings that operate in a different plane of thought and existence to us. For those who have played Bloodborne and are familiar with the Great Ones, will automatically realise that the authors are meaning to evoke this same kind of idea of cosmic being. In the linguistic evidence shown by the great cosmic Axiotl and by Last Protagonist that we looked over in the previous chapter, we know that Outer Gods are Outer Gods because they exist out with this plane of existence, they are outside the order established on the mortal plane of Elden Ring. The cosmic and the divine have often intersected in fantasy before, and so this shouldn't be a massive concept for us to understand. In this world there are grounded gods, elected by these higher beings to rule on their behalf, gods like Marika. Then there are the cosmic gods that exist outside our human understanding of life and outside the normal parameters of this world. As you have no doubt sensed by the amount of quotes that I've used, my main allegory for this entire video is the Silmarillion and the Lord of the Rings mythos. The gods of that universe, Iluvatar and the Valar, are also cosmic in nature, as the events of creation, as detailed in the Silmarillion, take place within the void of space. But beyond their cosmic and inhuman nature, many questions still remain. Where did they come from? Did the Greater Will create them? Are they themselves aspect of the Greater Will? Or do they exist entirely separately from the Greater Will? What will follow will of course be my own speculation, but let us start with a very basic fact about the Outer Gods, that they are very, very old. Firstly, the Outer God of Rot is referred to as Ancient in the Blue Dancer charm, as it reads as follows. A cloth doll depicting a dancer garbed in blue, an ancient heirloom of some sort. The dancer in blue represents a fairy, who in legend bestowed a flowing sword upon a blind swordsman. Blade in hand, the swordsman sealed away an ancient god, a god that was wrought itself. In addition, we know the outer god of the deathbirds and their death rites has also existed for a very long time, given they have existed in the time before the Erd Tree, and this is told to us directly by the explosive ghost flame item description, which reads as follows. In the time when there was no Erd Tree, death was burned in ghost flame. Deathbirds were the keepers of that flame. So you get the picture. So if these beings are so old, then it is possible that the Outer Gods are individual concept that fractured into the existence when the One Great itself was fractured and life began to spread. This is an idea presented by the Reddit user Lapsus55 in a comment where they liken the Outer Gods as representations of certain fundamental laws in the world, like death and disease. There are those that take this idea further, that the Greater Well created these concepts, created these Outer Gods, or that they are beings that were also birthed from the fracturing of the One Great, i.e. they too are products of its hands. I don't believe that the Greater Well created the Outer Gods, and personally my favourite theory is that the Outer Gods are cosmic beings that are completely external to the world of Elden Ring. Going back to those linguistic translations by the great cosmic Axiotl and last protagonist, that they are not creations of this world, nor do they belong to it. They are simply cosmic beings from the great void of space who have essentially been attracted to this world. That is at least my understanding on the emphasis that is put on these gods being external to this world. And again, we can find allegories for these beings in Tolkien's Legendarium. There are cosmic beings that also exist outside the creations of Iluvatar and are unknowable and not even understood by the gods themselves. For example, there's Ungoliant, the great spider who corrupted the two trees while allied with Melkor. In Chapter 8 of the Selmarillion, Ungoliant is described as having unknown origins, even to the Eldar, and is believed to have crawled from the abyss surrounding Arda, i.e. the void of space, and chose to remain there. Ungoliant, therefore, is an external being outside of the creation of Ardor who has simply come here. And at this point I'd just like to interject that if you are interested in Tolkien lore like I am, I would recommend the channel The Red Book. This is a tremendous channel that I've been enjoying immensely recently, who goes into a lot of depth and detail about specific topics in the Tolkien Legendarium. 
and I will link that channel below if you are interested. Like Ungoliant, I speculate that the Outer Gods are cosmic beings, unknowable and incomprehensible to us, separate from the creation of this world, that come from a realm beyond ours, and are drawn to this mortal plane like moths to a flame. I have nothing solid to back this up of course, beside the linguistic evidence that we've already looked at, and the usual tropes of great cosmic beings. With these ideas of the cosmic and external gods in mind, let us take a moment to analyse each of the confirmed outer gods to assess what their abilities and limits actually are. The first of the confirmed outer gods is the formless mother, or mother of truth, which Mo's communion with it results in him becoming the lord of blood. There is then the outer god of rot, one of the most directly referenced of their kind, and this is the god sealed underneath the lake of rot, and responsible for the spread of the scarlet rot and its incubation within millennia. Then we have the outer god of the death birds, that being which acts through its envoy, the twin bird, and her children, the death birds, who spread the death rites. Then finally the only other definitive outer god is confirmed via implication that we spoke about earlier, and this is the outer god of the frenzied flame, which spreads its influence through frenzy. There are other potential candidates, such as the forces behind the various moons, the god of the crystallians, or the fell god, but quite frankly we just can't know for certain because they're not referred to directly as outer gods. And no, I do not believe there is an outer god of the dragons, and I will cover this in my Greater Well section shortly. But let us review the outer gods and attempt to answer some big questions. Namely, what do they want, and what can they actually do? Let us start with one that we have covered on the channel before, the Formless Mother, who Moog has become associated with. We learn via the Blood Boon incantation that blood is this Formless Mother's medium of communion and communication, as it reads, The Mother of Truth craves wounds. When Moog stood before her, deep underground, his accursed blood erupted with fire, and he was besotted with the defilement that he was born into. Via wounds and blood, the Formless Mother is able to spread her influence. As we learn via Mogwin's spear, Moog's enhanced powers come via his master blessing his accursed blood, telling us that this Formless Mother is actually able to affect blood to the point where it can empower Moog because of his defiled blood within his body. In turn, Moog communes with the Formless Mother by causing her wounds and spreading blood. Again, the more blood, the more her influence spreads. In regions where blood is abundant, such as Mogwin Palace and Rose Church in Liurnia, we can see this corruption taking place in the form of giant cysts, blood roses, and afflicted forms of life. And this is presumably a sample of how the world would be should the Formless Mother and her Lord of Blood claim dominion. And it is also important to note that this order, the Order of Blood, replicates the command structure of the Greater Will. There will be a God of Blood in Mikola, and there is a Lord of Blood in place of an Elden Lord, a stark mirror to Marika and her Elden Lord. So everything about this order, and about the powers of the Formless Mother and Outer God, is about corruption. Nothing here is being created. Let us look at another of the Outer Gods. The God of the Scarlet Rot, which is again a god we have touched upon in this channel. One of the most clear references to this god is via the Scorpion Stinger, but probably a more interesting reference comes from the Blue Dancer Talisman. We've already read that item description, but in essence it talks about an event where this ancient god, a god that was rot itself, was sealed away. And from the item description of the Lake of Rot map, we know that it was sealed below, this lake of rot. Like the formless mother, this outer god exerts its influence over the world and corrupts it via a material. In this case, this material is the scarlet rot. Like the formless mother, it too has selected a vessel god, the powerful Melania, who serves as an infection vector for the scarlet rot, as we can see by her effect on Caled, which has spread the scarlet rot significantly. I speak on the Scarlet Rot in great detail in my Melania lore video, but what is clear is that the Scarlet Rot is no mere pestilence, 
but an aspect or a power of this outer god that will remake the world in its image. It doesn't just waste away the body as a pestilence. As Gowrie tells us, even the demigods could not rid the world of this pestilence. It is something more than mere disease. However, the Scarlet Rot isn't just death, it is also life. And we can get an idea of what this Order of Rot would look like via the Poison Mist incantation, which reads as follows. The death that begets life that comes to all equally. That is to say, it is the cycle of rebirth put into practice. Sweeping death brought via pestilence, and new life rising from the carrying of the dead, such as the silverfish-like pests. This is of course realistic, as in the real world when things die, new life comes from that death. You get maggots and flies in the corpses of the dead, as well as bacteria growing within carrion. The scarlet rot is a transformative medium that would transform and kill life on this earth, but also bring about new forms of life. We get a preview of what such a world would be like in the afflicted lands of Caelid and the hollowed out Halig tree. Life, certainly, but also death in abundance. A cycle of death and life. There's also the most enigmatic of the definitive outer gods, and that is the outer god of the death birds and their twin bird mother. This is again a subject I've spoke on in great detail in my death birds video, but again this outer god is focused upon spreading its influence upon the land, notably in its dominion over funerary practices in the age before the Erd tree and the spreading of its death rites. However, the most important probably to consider for this argument is the frenzied flame. And like the prior two examples, the outer god of chaos does not act directly upon the world, but acts through emissaries such as the Three Fingers, maidens like Hayeta, and the demon Shabriri, as well as having a corrupting force like the others, the frenzied flame, and the spread of the frenzy affliction. The aim of this outer god is to once again affect which has already been created by the greater will, unmaking it so that the life is melted down into one form. I will be doing a Frenzied Flame lore video in the near future, so I won't go into it too much depth, but suffice it to say that this outer god spreads its influence via the Frenzied Flame much as the Formless Mother does by blood, and like the God of Rot does via the Scarlet Rot. So while this outer god does operate in the same general manner as the others, it is unique in that it stands more starkly as a mirror reflection to the greater will, and indeed it is such an inverse of the greater will that some believe that it was once a part of the greater will, that the two fingers and the three fingers were once one, making a whole hand, or that at the very least it proves that the greater will is an outer god because the frenzied flame is so similar in its nature to the greater will. And of course while these are valid, I do not necessarily agree with either and instead I see the outer god of chaos and its stark mirroring of the greater will as posturing as a mockery of the greater will and its ideals, mainly because it seeks to undo the greater will's idea of life. And indeed I don't see it as much different from the positions taken by the outer god of blood for example. All of these outer gods follow the same pattern, they are attempting to corrupt the lands between but they will also offer up a new pantheon, directly copying and perverting the established pantheon of the greater will. The formless mother offers the most complete example of what I mean. There is a lord of blood in opposition to the Elden Lord, and there could be a god of blood in opposition to Marika. We see partial constructions of this in the other outer gods as well, such as Melania being groomed to become the goddess of rot, and the player character who can become the Lord of Frenzied Flame in opposition to the Elden Lord. Everything that the Outer Gods take, they take from the Greater Will, and there may be some cosmic balance to it that we don't fully comprehend, that there needs to be a Lord or there needs to be a God. My point being is that the Frenzied Flame manifesting the Three Fingers doesn't automatically mean that we need to think of the Two Fingers and the Three Fingers being one hand, there are many two fingers after all, so it's not like there is just one two fingers. There are two fingers in each of the divine towers, and there is of course a two fingers for Rani. 
so there isn't a total of five fingers anyway, so this has never really made much sense to me. And I see this two fingers plus three equals five as too literal an interpretation. Instead, I see it as symbolic, that the frenzied flame outer god has chosen three fingers to represent its vision of uniting everyone once again as whole, that the three and the two do make a whole five, a whole hand, but it is symbolic, symbolic of its ideals, rather than it literally being three fingers that were torn from the two. That just doesn't make sense to me. I believe that the frenzied flame is essentially just a mockery of the greater will's position because it mirrors its own ideals so starkly. Everything the outer gods do is based around the greater will, in subverting something the greater will has already created and established. They do not create anything. And this brings me to the very meat of why I do not believe the greater will is an outer god, for it has done something they cannot. It has created life. The outer gods corrupt, subvert, or destroy that which has already been made by the greater will, almost as if they enviously eye the lands between and this mortal plane, a parallel to Melkor and Iluvatar from Lord of the Rings. The god of rot will afflict the world with pestilence so that new life may emerge from the death, but all of this is based upon the greater will's already living creation, the greater will's lands and peoples. So too could be said of Moog and his formless mother. We see a preview of their world in Mogwin's palace, an infested world of blood and blood crazed beasts, yet a corruption it remains. This is not true creation. The greater well formed life, like clay can be moulded, on a scale far beyond any of the outer god's powers. Yes, they have servants, envoys and vassals, and they can corrupt, but what is that compared to the scale of the greater will's creation? This ultimately begs the question at the core of this video, what is the greater will? The name itself, greater will, is a term to me that has always suggested that it is the greatest of these cosmic beings, and throughout the following sections I will attempt to prove this by showing its relationship to life, creation and order. Remember the outer gods are external gods because they are external to this world. The greater well created life on this earth, it can't possibly be an external god because it is so intrinsically linked to the life on this earth, and that is what I will show through the next following chapters, that the main reason it is not an outer god or an external god is because it is not external to this world, it is intrinsically linked to it in fact. Indeed, the way in which the Greater Will is referred to by NPCs is as if this being is truly the ultimate authority in this plane of existence. The tragic corruption of the Order has taken its toll. Across the realm, life lies in ruin, fallen to pieces. Foul curses and misery spread, unabating. But the Greater Will has not abandoned the realm, nor the life that inhabits it. The mad taint of their newfound strength triggered the shattering. A war from which no lord arose. A war leading to abandonment by the Greater Will. Both of these references to the Greater Will and its abandonment of the world already creates an image of a god whose very domain is the safekeeping of this world and the lands found within it much like the biblical god. And much like the biblical god, his creations can disappoint him and be renounced, much like the demigods and indeed Marika for her actions. The Christian imagery associated with the greater will and its punishments are undeniable, with the punishment of Marika being crucified, the punishment of the magma worms being akin to the serpent being cursed to crawl along their bellies, and the punishment of the guilty with briars just to name a few. 
And as we will discuss later, there are parallels of the Ten Commandments to be made with the teachings of the Two Fingers. In consort with the biblical language in the Japanese associated with the Greater Will, this imagery and relationship between the Greater Will and its world very much paints the picture of a supreme Abrahamic deity. One of the other massive similarities the Greater Will has to the biblical God is of course creation, and I want to start this discussion with what I see not only as the most important dialogue for this discussion, but one of the most important dialogues in the entire game. I am of course referring to Hyetta's dialogue after she has touched the frenzied flame and begins to divine its will. Thank you. Thank you. I have touched them. The words of the three fingers, as your maiden, allow me to divine them. All that there is came from the one great. Then came fractures, and births, and souls. But the greater will made a mistake. Torment, despair, affliction, every sin, every curse, every one born of the mistake. And so, what was borrowed must be returned. Melt it all away with the yellow chaos flame until all is one again. I do not understand why it took me so long to realise how significant this dialogue truly is. Of course I understood its importance in regards to the one great and the motivations of the frenzied flame. However, when researching for my dragon lore video, it finally clicked. The greater will has the power of creation and in fact is most likely responsible for all life that we find in this world. While this is evident to most as it was for me, the importance of it is something that is often overlooked. And so let us analyse this dialogue. Firstly, Hayeta states that it was the greater will who was responsible for the division of the one great. So what is the one great? Well, there are those who argue that the greater will once formed part of the one great due to the similarities between the word great in one great and greater will. Yet again, I turn to Dugman Guide to disprove this, where he states that the differences in language used, specifically the biblical language associated with greater will, makes it far distinct from one great. And to me, it's a concept that we're not really meant to understand. It's back to this idea of cosmic creation. But ultimately, I just see it as a form of life that was just whole and not divided, and is something that we can't really understand. And that ultimately, all life that we now see in the Lands Between was once all melded together in a singular form, like different pots, cups and plates being made from the same batch of clay. The life found within this one great has been taken and divided and distinguished from something that was whole and indistinguishable. Burn the Erd Tree to the ground and incinerate all that divides and distinguishes. Ah, oh, may chaos take the world. May chaos take the world! Yet divided it was, and life took on new desperate forms, leading to the species that we see today. In my Dragon's Lore video, I did consider the question of how the Greater Will actually achieved this, how it fractured this one great. As pointed out in a Sinclair Lore podcast, which I will link below, Sophie and Sin make the great point that when the Greater Will acts, it never acts directly, hence it has a vassal beast, a vassal god, two fingers, Elden Lord and Elden Ring to enforce its rule on the lands between. And this then brings me back to one of the most important item descriptions in the game, the Elden Stars, which reads as follows. It is said that long ago, the Greater Will sent a golden star bearing a beast into the lands between, which would later become the Elden Ring. I therefore theorise that the Greater Will always acts through its intermediaries, and that the advent of the One Great being fractured must be no different. So the arrival of the Elden Beast and the Elden Ring, to me, is a significant event 
that marks the beginning of the Greater Will's influence on this world, and I believe it was the presence and arrival of the Elden Ring and Elden Beast that influenced the One Great and began the fracturing process. That these two events, the fracturing and the arrival of the Elden Ring, are two intersecting events. To me, the Greater Will is very biblical in that it has two main facets to its domain, the creation of life being number one, and the enforcement of order upon that life that it has created. The idea of order being a primary concern of the Greater Will is told to us early on in its mythos, with the arrival of the Elden Beast, its vassal beast, upon the mortal plane, for its remembrance reads as follows. It was the vassal beast of the Greater Will and a living incarnation of the concept of order. The concept of order was literally introduced to the world by the Greater Will, and those who brandish the Elden Ring are representatives of that order, the enforcers of the Greater Will's order. We know that the Elden Ring is a tool that enforces the laws and order of the world, for we know via the Mending Rune of the Death Prince that each incarnation of the Elden Ring built up by its different runes, is an order. And this makes sense, given the runes of the Elden Ring govern the laws of this world in a certain manner that together, holistically, encompasses an order. Radataskor has done a great video on this very subject, called The Greater Well Doesn't Care About the Golden Order, and I will link that video below. In that video, Radataskor highlights the depictions of the Elden Ring found within Farmazula, and speculates on something I also have in various videos, that this was the Elden Ring brandished by Placidusax in the time of the Dragon's Rule, an Elden Ring that represented an order for a far more primeval era. In this video, Raditaskor aptly says that the Greater Will just wants an order, and doesn't necessarily care what form order takes. I agree, but we take it further in that I don't think it's necessarily that the Greater Will doesn't care, more that the Greater Will recognises that for different eras, different forms of order and different laws are required, whether that be the more wild era of the Crucible and the Dragon's Elden Ring, or the more refined and ordered period of the Golden Order, and whatever version of order we seek to impose as Radigan's successor. All that is required that there be an order that meets the need of that particular era. And while these actually govern the laws of the world, one can't help but see the parallels between the biblical God again, with the set of commandments and the moral code and laws that would derive from it. This brings us back around to the idea of life. We've already looked at how the greater will fills the biblical role of a God through its creation and its application of law and punishment, as well as the symbolism and imagery associated with the Greater Will. However, I want to look at the Greater Will's relationship with life, which I believe is pivotal in understanding its true nature, and how it stands apart from the other outer gods. Thanks to the Godskin Noble Set, we know that the Crucible was the primordial form of the Erd Tree, and this is important because they are both tied to the Greater Will, and the Greater Will's management of life. First of all, we know that the Crucible was a churn, where all life was blended together. For the aspects of the Crucible incantations, I'll read the following. This is a manifestation of the Erd Tree's primal vital energies, an aspect of the primordial Crucible, where all life was once blended together. We also learn from the Gilded Great Shield that once found within the Crucible was primordial matter, which reminds me of the primordial soup and the matter found within of our own planet's history. This hot broth contained the building blocks to all life on our Earth. Likewise, the Crucible seems to be the source of all life on this Earth, as indeed, the aspects of the Crucible incantations does say not just life, but all life. And indeed, Soluria's spear item description backs up this idea, given that the Crucible is close in nature to life itself. It is the source of life. Now, while we learn that all life was blended together in the Crucible, I do not believe that the unity of life is the purpose of this era, and indeed, I more actually see the Erdtree era as the idea of convergence and regression, 
but that's something I talk about in more detail in my Erdtree lore video. Instead, I believe the Crucible is the way in which the One Great was divided up and desperate life was born from it. And the reason that all life was blended together within the Crucible is that it was the next stage in evolution from the One Great, which itself was life all blended together. And to me, it was through the Crucible that life was fractured and made desperate. The fact that all life is tied to this source, and thus the greater will, is backed up by its successor and next evolutionary form, the Erd Tree. Straight off the bat, we can establish that all natural life is seen as connected to the Erd Tree, something we learn via the greatest lore item in the game, the Albanoric Blood Clot. This top tier item reads as follows. The thick, coagulated blood of the Albanorics. Albanorics are life forms made by human hands. Thus, many believe them to live impure lives, untouched by the Erd Tree's grace. Thus, if Albanorics are seen as untouched by the Erd Tree's grace because they are artificial, then the implication must be that all natural life is seen as connected to the Erd Tree. And indeed, if the Erd Tree is the next form of the Crucible, and the Crucible is the source of all life, this makes sense, that these two mediums of the Greater Will's power are intrinsically linked to life itself. One begat life, and one controls life. And again, if you want an in-depth look at the Erd Tree and what its actual function is, I would highly recommend my Erd Tree lore video, in which I go into detail on its control over the cycle of life. But in short, the Erd Tree establishes a new era of life, a new system through which the Greater Will and its vassals can control life. The laws of regression and causality of the Golden Order speak of life being connected and how life will regress and ultimately converge. Regression towards the mean means that outliers cannot be tolerated and life must exist within a more refined set of parameters, ultimately moving towards convergence of all life. This convergence is achieved by life literally being recycled through the Erd Tree via Erd Tree burial. Even in death, the materials are reabsorbed and recycled through the Erd Tree. I have always seen the process of Erd Tree burial as a way of recycling this life, that the dead are given back to the Erd Tree and absorbed, and that this era of the Erd Tree, unlike the era of the Crucible, is about the status quo, about refining and controlling the growth of life. But if the dead are absorbed by the Erd Tree and this is a cycle of life, I have always wondered, are new life forms born from the Erd Tree? Well, we may have found a plausible answer thanks to the keen mind of the Tarnished Archaeologist. In Tarnished Archaeologist's video, Elden Ring's Cycle of Life, which I highly recommend as it goes into far more depth on these ideas of the cycle of life, he makes an astute observation on the doors found within catacombs, where the Erd Tree burials themselves take place. On the design of these doors, we see bodies being absorbed by the roots of the Erd Tree, and, as Tarnished Archaeologist says, this is a literal representation of what we see in Erd Tree burial. With that in mind, Tarnished Archaeologist ponders if what we see at the base of the tree is literal, then can the same be applied to what we see at the top of this depiction, as we see people being born as if fruit or dew from a tree. Tarnished Archaeologist supports the idea that life is born from the Erd Tree by citing the dialogues of Melina if you go to choose the Frenzied Flame path. In this dialogue, where Melina pleads with you not to choose the path of the Frenzied Flame, Melina equates the destruction of the Erd Tree via the burning of it in the Frenzied Flame as literally the denial of new life, as if birth and life is tied to the Erd Tree itself. Finally, Tarnished Archaeology also backs up the Erd Tree's association of recycling life with Renala's Amber Egg likening it to an amber from the Erd Tree, which enclosed a great rune of rebirth, and the process of its rebirth is a microcosm of the Erd Tree's command over the cycle of life. And at this juncture in the video, I do just want to ask you to check out Tarnished Archaeologist's channel. They really are a detail-focused channel, and videos like their Erd Tree is an illusion video really have me rethinking what I believe about the game's fundamentals. Again, the entire point of this segue 
about the Erd Tree and the Crucible is that the Greater Will is not just the creator of life, but also the god who oversees it, controls and manages it, but is intrinsically linked to it via the Erd Tree, the Crucible and the Elden Ring. Life is so intrinsically linked to the Greater Will that it can't possibly be termed as an outer god. An outer god literally is an external god as we have discussed before. How can the greater will be one of their number when it is so intrinsically tied to the very nature of life found within its world? It very much is the opposite of an external god. And I think the greater will's deep connection, the intrinsic link to life found on this planet, is no better illustrated than by its connection to the dragons. And so it's to these ancient beasts that we turn to next. In my prior lore video on the ancient dragons, I related the chief of their kind, Placidusax, to a Tiamat, the Mesopotamian god of the sea and a being symbolic of the chaos of primordial creation. And as I said in that video, I feel as though this is an apt connection, because the dragons are meant to be symbolic of the early primordial era of life on a planet as we know they belong to the period known as prehistory. And this is something we can learn from any of the dragon protection talismans, which read as follows. The ancient dragons who ruled in the prehistoric era before the Earth Tree would protect their lord as a wall of living rock. And so it is that the shape of the dragon has become symbolic of all manner of protections. In a way, they evoke the era of the dinosaur to us, the same idea of primal, primeval life in a chaotic era of life that is so beyond human comprehension. It is easy to see these mighty reptilian beasts taking the place of dinosaurs in this fictional world. However, something else I pondered in that video but didn't really explore was the deep connection the dragons have to the greater will and the perfection of their form. So let's go over that again with the most obvious connections of all, the fact that the dragons had an Elden Lord, a position of lordship that is clearly linked to the Elden Ring and therefore the Greater Will. There are people who would counter this claim by claiming that the term Elden does not appear in the Japanese. As I explained in a pinned comment on my Dragons lore video, this simply is not true and I will now cite the opinion of various Japanese speakers. Firstly, I once again cite Dugman Guy an excellent source of Elden Ring item translations, and in his video Six Essential Elden Ring Item Descriptions in Japanese, he confirms that the term Eld, found in the Japanese, appears both in the item description of Elden Stars and the Dragon Lord's Remembrance in exactly the same way. I've also had this confirmed by a friend of the channel and reputable authority on the game's translation, Last Protagonist, who again confirmed to me that the Dragon Lord Remembrance in the Japanese clearly paints Placidusax as Elden Lord. There are also other translations which repeat the same sentiment, such as the Reddit comment by user Lamy1, which I will link below, and a comment on my Dragon's video from viewer Teo. And so, if you do disagree with this point, I highly recommend that you check out all of these sources, especially Dugman Guy's video. So with the semantics firmly tied to the term Elden Lord, what other ties can be seen between the dragons and the greater will? As I said at the onset of this chapter, I feel the very makeup of the dragons shows that at their core they are closely tied to the greater will and its gold. Firstly, we can see the gold prominently displayed on their physiology, on the golden membrane of their wings. And this facet of their physiology is explored in detail by Zuli the Witch in their A Horrible Nightmare video, which I will link below. In this video, Zuli correctly identifies that this gold only appears on the soft tissue of their dragons, whereas the rest of their body is covered in the gravel stone scales. The gold appears on portions like the wing membrane or the wounds of Placidusax, i.e. on the skin underneath his stony scales. I find this to be a really exciting detail because it means the literal flesh of these beings is gold, tying them to the greater will more closely than other beings, given their skin and flesh is literally gold. This is tied to the fact that the red lightning wielded by the dragons itself is imbued with gold, 
as is directly stated by the Gravelstone Talisman. Finally, the Elden Lord of the Dragons, Placidusax, has a closer tie to the Greater Will via his powerful breath. Unlike the orange, fiery breath of his brethren, Placidusax has a golden fire, as is stated in Placidusax's Ruin. As I did mention in my Dragon Lore video, golden fire is significant not only because it is the gold of the Greater Will, but because there is only one other being that breathes this type of golden fire, the Elden Beast. The Elden Beast is very much directly tied to the Greater Will. It is the vassal beast of the Greater Will and brought the Elden Ring to the lands between. That Placidusax is granted very similar powers to a vassal of the Greater Will itself implies a deep connection between the dragons and the Greater Will, especially between their Elden Lord. Earlier on in the video, I argued that the Greater Will fills the role of the Abrahamic or Christian God as a grand creator deity, and as I said in my Dragons video, I feel the dragons are almost too perfect. They are perfect vessels for its vision. They are immortal and they wield gold and are immensely powerful and intelligent beings. Farmazilla was their domain, and in that domain there is an inscription or depiction of the Elden Ring in a more primal form. Myself and many others believe that the dragons were the first custodians of the Elden Ring, and that Placidusax and his god that is now fled were the vassal pantheon, much like Godfrey and Marika would be later on. The dragons are so perfect, the perfect instruments to wield the Elden Ring, so in tune with the gold and so powerful. And given the fact that the gold is very much part of their physiology, they feel like they are handcrafted. In Genesis of the Bible, God also makes a handcrafted being designed specifically to rule over on his behalf, humans. And so now I'm going to read from the Genesis part of the Bible just so you get an understanding of what I'm referring to. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God he created, male and female he created them. God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground. God made humanity in his image and they were his instrument on the earth that he had created to rule over all life. Is it possible that the grand creator of Elden Ring's world is parallel with this and made his own perfect creations designed to rule over all other life forms. Like the Christian God, are the dragons made in the Greater Will's image? One can't help but return to the Elden Beast, which itself is fairly draconic in appearance, a cosmic being and breathes fire like the dragons do. This is a being as close to the Greater Will as we will ever see, and is it possible that the dragons too were made in its image, the perfect beings to rule over the Greater Will's new domain, another parallel that sets it as the Abrahamic God of this world, of Elden Ring's world. Even if you don't believe that this is a parallel, the hand of the Greater Will upon the dragons is undeniable, its influence in developing this perfect life form, a being that lives beyond time and literally has gold in its very DNA. This again seems something far beyond what the outer gods are capable of. They corrupt and transform life that already exists, but here we have a god manipulating a life form at its very core, at its very DNA, infusing it with its gold. And much like the biblical god, it seems as though the greater will has had a hand in helping societies develop and guiding his creations. There is of course the beastmen, who we learn have been granted intelligence, that before they were just beasts. For the Cinquodea item description, reads as follows. The design celebrates a beast's five fingers, symbolic of the intelligence once granted upon their kind. The beastmen of Farmazula were once granted intelligence, and as described by the bestial vitality incantation, they were once beasts that became something more. They were beings that were given intelligence to them rather than having it evolved, and they were moved from beasts to being beings who wielded stone tools, as described by the bestial sling and later iron tools, 
as described by the Beastman Cleaver. This very much mirrors the development of our ancestors from the Stone Age through to the Iron Age, but instead reminds me of 2001 A Space Odyssey, in which humanity and its ancestors are guided through different stages of development by an outside cosmic intelligence. Whoever we credit the granting of intelligence to, it will always lead back to the Greater Will's designs, whether it was Placidusax, the Elden Beast, or the Elden Ring. And again, it makes me think of the Biblical God, who in the Bible is described as teaching humanity at various points, such as through the lessons taught to Adam and Eve and Cain and Abel. And earlier I did speak about the Ten Commandments, how in the Bible these came down to humanity via God and they helped develop the idea of morals and laws. And indeed, in Elden Ring, we get the idea that it too, the greater will, gave us commandments or words of faith via the Two Fingers heirloom, which reads as follows. Fingers cannot speak, yet these were eloquent. Persistently did they wriggle, spelling out mysteries in the air. Thus did we gain the words, the words of our faith. How closely is this tied to the Ten Commandments coming down from an Abrahamic God? These are the words, the words of faith, the words of the greater will coming down to us. Again, it just fills the role for me of that Abrahamic God. And now with that all said, I think it's time we do a summary of everything we have discussed in this video. When the greater will sent the Elden Beast and the Elden Ring down to the mortal plane, the aim was to create diverse life. And I am of the belief that the Elden Beast and the fracturing of the One Great are coinciding events to stimulate life, and that life as we know it in this world of Elden Ring is therefore intrinsically linked to the Elden Ring. It was begat of it, and therefore all life is connected to the Erd Tree and the Greater Will. Earlier on in this video, we determined that Outer Gods are named so because they are external to this group or this world. How can the Greater Will be considered an external god when it is so closely tied to life on this planet and the creation of this life? It is as much part of this world as we are as the Tarnished. Like the Abrahamic Biblical God, the Greater Will has its chosen vassals, its prophets, its envoys, and its holy scriptures and ideas come from the Two Fingers. Life and society has been guided by this Supreme Creator. For all intents and purposes, the greater will dominates life on this world and imposes its will and order upon all. This to me stands in stark contrast to the outer gods, who are only able to manipulate and corrupt that which has already been created by the greater will. In a way, they are lesser versions of the greater will, stylizing their own lesser orders and ideals on its established pantheon in an almost envious display of posturing. The connections to biblical iconography and language is undeniable. The crucifixion of Marika, the handing down of holy words from the two fingers, and the punishment of the guilty by briars. The outer gods are no doubt cosmic beings of immense power that we don't really understand, but they are external to this world. And while they are trying to subvert them, and they surely can with our help, the power and influence of the greater will towers above them and for me is something far greater than these outside meddlers, at least when it comes to this mortal plane. Whether or not you agree that the greater will is different from the outer gods, I believe there's plenty of evidence that helps establish its primacy, and that it is orders of magnitude greater than they are, especially when it comes to dealing with this mortal plane. And ultimately, for me, it takes the position of a grand supreme deity in this particular epic. So thanks guys, that is my take on the Greater Will and the Outer Gods and the difference there in between. If you liked this video, please consider giving a like and a subscribe, as I do primarily cover Elden Ring lore content. If you'd like to support the channel in other ways, I do have a membership and a Patreon. But until next time guys, let me know your thoughts on the Greater Will and comment below with anything you disagree with or anything you think I've missed. But until next time guys, I will see you at the feet of the two fingers. Take care and have a great day.